Hey, good to have you guys up here. Everybody get a handout. If not, AJ will get it to you. Just raise your hand. Raise that hand. We'll get you a handout. All right, Mike, way in the back, just pulling our leg. <laughs> All right. Well, as you um, go out today, just want to make you aware, if you're interested in giving in a free will offering toward the meal, there's plates at the back behind these two center sections of pews. That's totally optional for you, but if that's uh, something you'd like to do, that's where you would do that. Um, so let me introduce our guests. We, you pretty much know John Bowman if you've been coming here for any number of years. We've had him up uh, several times. He's a pastor down at Peace Haven Baptist Church in Yadkinville, North Carolina. So that's more of the western side of the state, just north of Winston-Salem, if that helps you out a little bit. So John's been there probably about 10 years, I think, 10 years as pastor there. So a um, good friend of mine, and I know that you'll just really enjoy what he has tonight. So Brother John, you come on up. Thank you so much. Food was great. Opportunity to be here. I've always uh, enjoyed being at the Abundant Life Baptist Church, and I'm um, uh, that is my handout. I can't remember what to put on there, though, so we probably won't even be using it tonight, but uh, it looks good to have anyway. We'll see how that goes. If you have your Bible, turn to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. I was reading a book some time ago, and it was alluding to another book. Uh, the name of the book was The uh, Fall of the Athenian Republic, and it was written by a guy named Professor Alexander Tyler. It's interesting about this guy is that he was writing in the early 1700s, which, you know, historically speaking, that would be several years before uh, the inception of the United States of America, so, of course, before our independence year of 1776. He wrote something interesting, though. He was talking about the um, uh, world empires of history, and he said this. He said, every world empire, on average, lasted about 200 years. Now, you know, if you're going back to Egypt and Assyria and Babylon and Medo-Persia and Greece and Rome, and you start adding it all together and then dividing it, well, you come up with about 200 years in world empires. And so he was making that statement. Now, again, he was speaking in reference to world empires, not the United States of America, because we were not even in existence yet. But then he made this statement. He said, he said every world empire pretty much rose and fell by the same sequence. And he said they would start in bondage. He said they would go from bondage to spiritual faith, spiritual faith to great courage, great courage to liberty, liberty to abundance, abundance to greed, greed to complacency, complacency to apathy, apathy into dependency, dependency back into bondage. Now, I'm personally a guy who believes history repeats itself. And right now, you, you would have to ask yourself this question. Where are we as a country? Now, I also believe this. I believe I'm a Christian before I'm an American. I have a great appreciation for our country, but we are not God's chosen people. Israel is God's chosen people. Israel's great because God chose Israel. America's great because America chose God. America is ceasing to choose God. Even as we look at this Equality Act and we look at some things that are going on in our country right now, we have to be aware as Christians that our country is becoming less and less what it used to be because our faith is changing. This Equality Act, if it keeps going and if it passes, this is just the beginning of what will one day establish a man like me, a criminal. The whole agenda is simply to make what is good illegal for the purpose of ushering, ushering in what is immoral. Now, I'm not saying everybody in Washington has that agenda. I'm not even saying every uh, person of a, a certain political party has that agenda. But I do want to make you aware today that as God's men, we do need some leadership to rise up. And every pastor that's preaching, whether it be John Bowman or Jeff Dietrich or whoever, Every pastor that is preaching in churches today need to be preparing their men and their families for suffering and for persecution. All who live godly will suffer persecution. And as we are looking around, the day will come, and it is fast coming, when it will be illegal to stand in this pulpit and preach Romans chapter 1. 
And I'm not one of these guys that harps on Romans chapter 1 or harps on a particular sin. And here's why. I know my sin, and I'm no better than anybody else. I'm saved by the grace of God. Somebody say amen. All right, more than three people. If you're saved by the grace of God, say amen. All right, and so tonight, as we come together, I just want to wanna talk to you a little bit about a man who is a great leader. I know Pastor Jeff has been doing this uh, for several weeks, but the Lord has led me to this passage in Exodus 3. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 3, and I want to look at just a few key things here. While you're turning there, just to set the, uh, I guess, to get the backdrop, uh, Moses is 80 years old at this point. Moses has been in the backside of the wilderness in Midian for some 40 years. And Moses at this point probably has given up on any hopes of ever uh, being anything significant for God. Now, one night he is out in the wilderness. He's a shepherd by trade. And the Bible says that he looks up and he sees a burning bush. Now, here's the thing about that. When Moses first saw it, probably nothing stood out to him. And here's why. Lightning strikes out in the wilderness all the time, probably hitting bushes all the time, setting bushes on fire. However, Moses looked, probably thought nothing of it, looks back again, thinks nothing of it, looks maybe the third time, and I'm speculating, this is a conjecture, but maybe looks the third time, and he sees, now wait a minute, normally a bush that's burning in the wilderness is already burned up, and this bush is not burning up, and so I need to turn and I need to see what's going on. So he approaches the bush. That's Exodus chapter 3. If you will, begin reading with me in verse 7. As Moses comes face to face with the tetragrammaton, the I am. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to a place or to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, God says, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. He says, come now, therefore, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people Bring out my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I? That I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. So he said, and I love this. The title of this message, as you look at the top of your paper, what does it say? It says, Certain Uncertainty. We'll talk about that as we work through this. He said, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God, our Bible says, on this mountain. Uh, Dr. Vicki Meldick did a very interesting survey or a study a few years ago. She conducted a study on Olympic medalists, and she discovered something that I found personally to be uh, pretty interesting and, and pretty astounding. She found that the bronze medalists in the Olympic Games were almost always more content and almost more joyful than the silver medalist. And in her research, you know, she wanted to know why are these bronze medalists happy and joyful, and why are the silver medalists not so joyful and not so happy? And she discovered the reason. Silver medalists, she says, they focus more on how close they came to winning the gold, and they become despondent. And the bronze medalists, they focus more on how close they came not to meddling at all, and they're more joyful. The silver medalist is focused on what I didn't get and how close I was to getting there. And the bronze medalist is focused more on how close I came not to meddling at all. And so they're happy that they just have a medal and that they get to stand on one of the pedestals. And so, you know, as we think about that, think about Moses here. In Moses' case, I believe he's kind of got the mindset of the silver medalist. I think he came so close to the gold medal of Egypt. You know what I'm talking about. I mean, he was the prince of Egypt for so long, 40 years he spent there, and possibly aspiring uh, to become uh, the leader of Egypt. And so in one moment, as you know, he's the meekest man in all the earth, the Bible says, and yet in one moment, our Bible tells us that he loses his cool. By the way, he did it twice, didn't he? And he lost both times. The first time, though, you remember what happened. He kills a man in in a fit of rage, and he has to run off at 40 years old to Midian. Now, at 80 years old, we're in Exodus chapter 3. Moses hears from God, and the message is clear. Moses, stop focusing on what you've lost, and let's focus on what you still have left. 
Hey, let me say this to you guys because I know that many of you have probably experienced this. I've experienced it several times in my life. There's great loss that comes in your life. There's certain choices that, that, that are being taken from you, especially as you get older. Some of you younger guys, you won't know what we're talking about, but I'm 51 years old now. There's certain, my workout now has decreased exponentially than what it was even five years ago. And so there are certain choices that are being taken away from me as I get older. And then there are certain circumstances that have happened in my life that have taken choices away from me. And if I'm not careful, especially as you go through midlife, and some of you have been through that or going through that, when you go through that, a lot of times what you will do is you will focus more on what you've lost and the choices you can't make anymore as opposed to the choices you still have left. And what God wants to do with Moses, Moses for some 40 years, I'm sure that he is out in that wilderness and I'm sure he's talking, thinking about all of the choices that have been taken away from him and, and most of that by his own doing. And what God does is God shows up and says, okay, Moses, you've had some choices that have been taken away from you. We're not going to focus on the choices that have been taken away. We're going to focus on the choices that you still have left. Now, remember, for 40 years, Moses has been on the backside of the wilderness, and his thoughts, no doubt, have traveled daily to what he's lost. But God is very quick to remind Moses that he has a lot of life left. Now, parenthetically, I want to say this. Be careful, be careful to never build your life around something that's seasonal. Don't ever build your life around something that's seasonal. And here's why. If you build your life around something that's seasonal, when that season's over, your life's over. Your joy's over. I've done it a couple of times in my life. And you get hit with this, just a wall of depression because you've built your entire life and your entire existence around something that is seasonal. It is so important that we have hobbies and it's so important that we have aspirations, whether it be vocationally or it be recreationally. It doesn't matter. I mean, those things are, are great and they're good. However, do not build your life around them because sooner or later, it's going to end. And when it ends, you think about these professional athletes. And you think about how they hang on and hang on and hang on. I know y'all love Tom Brady. He just keeps hanging on. Uh, any no Tom Brady fans in here? Praise the Lord. All right, good. But sooner or later, Tom's career has to end. And if he's built his entire life and his existence and his joy around football, sooner or later, that season's going to end. And when that season ends, his joy ends. Now, looking at Moses... Moses most likely built his life around that season of Egypt. And I don't know exactly what his aspirations were. I don't know how much he understood. The Bible's not clear how much he understood about what God had for him. But I think he's gotten to a point here where he feels like he has totally blown it. And I want to remind everybody in here, if you've got air in your lungs, you've still got purpose in life. Paul said this, I'm forgetting those things which are behind. I'm reaching forth unto those things which are before me. Many of you right now, you may have given up. Many of you right now, you may have think I've blown it. It might have been a sin. It might have been a failure. It might have, you just blew it. You know, I don't know what you did. I do know this, though. I still believe in the grace of God. Anybody believe in the grace of God? I still believe that God has purpose. And so Paul says it well. He says, I'm forgetting those things which are behind, and I'm reaching forth unto those things which are before me. I'm going to confess that sin. I'm going to uh, walk away from that failure. I'm going to let God's grace pick me up and carry me. And that's all really that God wants to do here. I do laugh when I read Exodus 3 and 4 because it's clear that Moses is very enthusiastic. Y'all know people like this, and you might even be one of them. I've been one of them before in my life. We're always very enthusiastic about what God wants to do until we find out God wants to do it with us. Somebody help me. Oh, yeah, we're very, we're very excited about what God wants to do until God says, and I want you to do it. Moses in this chapter, I, I, I laugh when I read it. Every time I read it, I laugh because I'm watching as God is talking to Moses, and I'm, Moses is like, great idea, good. You're going to deliver the people, and I want you to do it. And y'all know, did, did any of y'all watch uh, What You Talking About Willis? Anybody remember that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Moses is kind of like, what you talking about, Lord? Well, you, you want me to do it? In the past 40 years, Moses has been a man, honestly, and all of us are going to relate to what I'm about to say, fear. Fear. Moses has become a man of fear. Here's what's interesting. Do you realize that inherently we are only born with two fears? Inherently, 
we are only born with two fears. When, when you come out of your mother's womb, you have two automatic fears. Number one, the fear of falling. Number two, the fear of loud noises. Automatically, you are, already, you are born with the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. Now, I said that to say this. That means that every other fear that you or I have are not inherent fears, they are learned fears. They're learned fears. Right now, every fear beyond those two, somehow, some way, we have learned them. Every fear that's in my life, I have learned. And here's the beauty in that. If I can learn a fear, I can unlearn a fear, right? If I have learned the fear, then I can unlearn the fear. This is what God's doing in his life. I gave you a few words there. They're words that I can't even pronounce, but I'm going to try. And some of you, some of you guys that are more, uh, I guess, astute in the areas of word pronunciation, you can help me with my phonics later. But as you're looking at these words, number one, I'm going to try this, and I'm going to fail at it, but I'm going to try. Triskaidekaphobia. Does anybody know what that is? Without Googling, it's the fear of the number, not three, 13. How about this one? I'm going to have an even tougher time with this. Arachibut, I can't even do it, all right? Arachibuterophobia. And I know I got the emphasis on the wrong syllable there, all right? What is that? What is it? No, that's arachnophobia. It's the fear of peanut butter sticking to the top of your mouth. It's a real fear. How about phobophobia? Phobophobia is just the fear of having another fear to come into your life. You see how ridiculous it is? Psychology books tell us this. They tell us that there are some documented 2,000 fears in people's lives, most of which they have learned through certain circumstances and experiences. We have, all of our lives, been doing this. We have been downloading fear viruses. Moses, for 40 years, has been downloading fear viruses. They haunt his mental programs, and they haunt ours too. They actually contaminate our spiritual hard drives. I mean, you think about this. They, 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 they literally, literally corrupt our heart and emotional files. And so we have to be aware, these viruses, they are learned fears. And I'm saying all that because Moses has learned some fears, and God's purpose is that Moses would not, he, he understands that he's learned them, and God wants him to unlearn every one of these fears. Interestingly, you, you know, we're not going to go over to chapter 4, but interestingly, Moses in chapter 4, do you, remember, do you remember what he identifies himself as? He says this. This is his fear. He says, I have a fear of public speaking. Now, I can relate to this. When the Lord called me to preach and started calling me to preach, that's what I brought to the Lord. I wanted to be a lawyer. I was already studying pre-law at Liberty University. And when God started dealing with me about being a preacher, you know, I didn't necessarily, I guess I hadn't put it together that in, in, in the legal field you have to do some public speaking. But I thought, you know, well, that's one thing. But standing up and preaching every week, that's something else. And I remember taking that to the Lord and saying, Lord, I can't do it. I don't want to do it. I, I, you know, I, I hate public speaking. Now, as you can see, I kind of got over it. But, you know, at, at the very beginning, it was kind of like, Lord, I can't do that. I read recently something that I thought was incredibly interesting. I read that there was a poll taken and that of all the people that were polled in this particular survey, most of them feared public speaking more than they feared death, which means they would rather die than give a speech. I remember kind of feeling that way, though. I'm probably talking to some people right now. You like that behind-the-scenes thing. And by the way, God's called people to be behind-the-scenes. 
But God's called people to step out and speak. And many of you, God may have been dealing with you about doing something along that line. And I just want to speak from personal experience and tell you, if you will give it to God, if he's called you to do it. My, my life verse became this a long time ago. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24 says, Faithful is he that calls you who also will do it. God is faithful. God will call you and God will enable you. God will empower you. And listen, it'll just be like second nature. For over 40 years, Moses has learned a fear of public speaking. Do you remember the what, what God did with Moses before he ever even brought it up. God had taken two things that there's no doubt that he was afraid of. People in Egypt and on the backside of Midian, they were very familiar with leprosy. And they were also very familiar with poisonous vipers. And do you remember what God did? God, right there in Moses, right there in front of Moses, says, okay, do this. First of all, you know, here, I want you to do a couple things. I want you to, you know, stick your hand in and your bosom, pull it out, leprosy. Now I want you to stick it back in, pulls it out, and he's healed. Pick up a poisonous snake. Hey, no, Moses had enough sense to know. You don't pick up a poisonous snake. Could have been a cobra. We don't know what kind of snake it was. Pick it up by the tail. And, and you, you know the story. What God was doing right there was God was demonstrating whatever you're afraid of, I'm greater than. Whatever you're afraid of, I'm greater than. You're afraid of leprosy? I got power over leprosy. By the way, there are two symbols of death and horrible death at that. Leprosy is a horrible death. Dying from a snake bite, it's a horrible death. And so God takes power and overcomes both of those things right there with Moses. And what does Moses do? He does what many of you do and, many, and, and what I do sometimes. God has already demonstrated that he has power over that which we fear, and yet we will bring up our fears to him as though, oh, well, here's something that's greater than that, God. I can't speak. That's greater than leprosy, Moses? That's greater than, than, than a snake? Come on, Moses. I mean, I just showed you that I am greater than all of these things. God overcame the snake. God overcame the leprosy. And as you know, God overcame Moses' fear of public speaking. But this is what this process is. This process is God's way of unlearning in you and in me what we have learned in life. Because this culture and this world imposes fear. You remember what God told Paul to write to Timothy? I have not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. God does not want you and God does not want me walking in fear. He hasn't given us that spirit. And yet we have learned so many fears in our life and God is right there saying to every one of us, I want you to unlearn the fear. Unlearn the fear. Here's what God really wants to do. A divine download, I guess you could say. He wants to create what's called a cognitive category in your mind. Let me explain what a cognitive category is and how it works. When I was 24 years old, I bought a 1986 white, full-size, 4x4 Chevrolet Blazer with a 350 throttle body in it. It was white on the outside, it was blue on the inside, and man, it was pretty pretty. Now, here's the thing, though. There's really nothing outstanding about a white Chevrolet full-size 1986 Blazer. You drive it around, nobody notices it. Nobody thinks a thing about it. So I get this thing, and I'm driving around for several months unnoticed, virtually undetectable to society. I'm just driving around, nobody notices. One thing happens. One thing. And all of a sudden, Everybody notices me. People are waving at me. People are yelling at me. Sometimes they're yelling obscenities at me. And what happened? Some of you are already whispering what it is. What happened that changed everything? What is it? OJ. And, 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 and I was driving a blazer. They were in a Bronco. And it wasn't even O.J.'s Bronco, it was Al Calling's Bronco. O.J.'s Bronco was parked at his house. But they had a 1993 full-size 4x4 white Bronco, but because mom was white and it kind of looked like a Bronco, now I'm O.J. People are yelling O.J. to me. Yo, O.J. No lie. I mean, all of a sudden, you know, I'm the least popular guy in my town, 
and then the next day, I am the most popular guy in my town driving around. I just got to where I just started waving, you know, just hello, you know, what else are you going to do? Now, here's what happened. Before, in people's minds, now think about this, 100 million estimated people watched the broadcast of that police chase. So 100 million people that day had a cognitive change, a brand new cognitive category that they didn't have. There is, I put on your paper an RAS, it's a reticular activating system. That's what it is. It's a reticular activating system on your paper. And I didn't write that out, but that's what it is. Now, what that is, is that's a cluster of nerves at the very stem of your brain. What that cluster of nerves does is it, it, it's what allows certain things into your brain and certain things to be, to, to, to be out of your thought process. Now, here, here's how it works. You'll have an experience in your life and there will be objects that are associated with that experience so that when you see those objects or you hear that song or you see that person, you automatically have a cognitive category that you didn't have before. All of the, the 100 million people before thought nothing of a white Bronco and thought nothing of, of a white blazer until now what's happened is their brains are allowing that to be noticed. For example, most of you have probably experienced this. Most of you have probably bought a new car or bought a car that's new to you. And it's a car like you've never had. For example, I'm a Tahoe guy. I've owned, over the last 10 years, I've owned two Tahoes, and I'm about to buy another one. I just like a Tahoe. Now, here's the thing. Before I ever bought one, I never really noticed a Tahoe. Now, I will see and notice every Tahoe on the road as I'm driving. Now, why? Here's why. There's a cognitive category that's there that wasn't there before. Now, many of you right now, you're thinking about a car. Uh, I bought a Honda Pilot a few years ago. I'm a, my wife's a Honda Pilot person. She's got to have a Honda Pilot. I've got to have a Tahoe. Here's the th when I bought the Honda Pilot, now I see every Honda Pilot that's on the road. I didn't see them before. Were they still there? Sure, they were there. See, that, what happens is this. There's a, there's a category, a cognitive category that's being created. Now, you say, what does that have to do with what we're talking about? Throughout your life and my life, there are cognitive categorical fears. And they come by way of personal experience so that when we get in those situations, we automatically become fearful because it imposed fear at the very beginning. And then we live our lives with that fear. Now, I, I, we all have a fear of falling. I, I have somewhat of a fear of heights. I was scheduled to go skydiving last Saturday, and I had to cancel, which is, you know, to my wife's liking. But you say, why would you go skydiving? Kind of because I have a fear of it. And that overcomes the fear. Now, I don't have to do it, and I may not, uh, it may end up at not, uh, being an opportunity again. But everybody in here, as you look back over your life, there's certain things that you're afraid of. And you've learned. I was born with the fear of falling, of course. But you've learned certain fears. And there's a cognitive category, I keep saying that word because it's so important, that has been formed and created in you because of that experience. And your brain is allowing that to come in and come in and come in. And you say, well, Pastor John, how in the world, how, how in the world do, you, do you get past that? You have to allow God to give you a cognitive category that surpasses and supersedes the fear. What God is doing here with Moses is God is saying, Moses, e there's a cognitive category in Moses' mind about Egypt. When he left there, he was afraid. When he left there, he was a fugitive. When he left there, he was a failure. When he left there, he was a murderer. So when you hear the, every time that he's heard Egypt, all he's thought about is failure, sin, murder, fugitive. That's all he's thinking about. And what God is saying is God is saying, you have a fear of Egypt. You have a fear of Pharaoh. You have a fear of what's happening there. And what he's saying is saying, Moses, 
I'm greater than your fear. This category that you are living under, this fear that you are living under, I'm greater than that. I can take care of the snake. I can take, ter- take care of the leprosy. I am that I am. And I can take care of your public speaking, and I will take care of everything that's down there. And he says this. He says, don't you love this word? Certainly. Certainly. Now, now at the top of your page, what does it say? It says certain uncertainty. I know this to be a fact. Whenever you start following God and whenever you start doing what he's called you to do, there will be certain uncertainties. In other words, God doesn't, God doesn't give Moses, he, he doesn't tell Moses, oh, here's what I'm going to do, Moses. I'm going to send this plague and this plague and this plague and this plague and this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. God doesn't do that. He's never done that. What God does is God says, certainly I'll go with you and I will overcome your fear and I will overcome any obstacle and any challenge that comes your way. Any oppression, any adversity, I'm greater than. And so just trust me, I've just created in you another category. It's that the snake can't harm you, the leprosy can't harm you, and ultimately Egypt and Pharaoh cannot harm you because I'm the one that's in charge. And that is what's supposed to help Moses with his fear, is that you associate fear and Egypt, you put them together. Well, I'm telling you, you don't have to associate Egypt with fear. You can associate Egypt, if you follow me, with victory and with exodus. And right now, think about what your fear is and what's holding you back. Because we started this off by talking about, we got a fight coming. There is a fight coming, and God wants us to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves, but he wants us to be bold, and he wants us to stand for the truth. And there's a certain fear of what this country and their leadership may at some point impose upon the church and upon Christianity in general. And at this point, God's saying, I'm greater than that. I'm more powerful than that. Don't you be afraid of that. You follow me. And there's a certain uncertainty about it. Right now, our country is in an uncertain place. Our future is in an uncertain place. But there is a certain God that takes care of the uncertainty. This is where you say amen. I'm going to get a, we need to put it on the screen. Okay, I'll I'll just, you know, how many of y'all know how to say amen in deaf language? Anybody know how to do that? That. Y'all help me. All right, on the count of three. One, two, three. No, no, this. All right, you can say amen too. All right, y'all do this right here. Ready? One, two, three. All right, let's say amen. So if you don't want to shout it, so you say, I have a problem with public speaking. Well, how about public fist, fisting, okay? You can just hit your hand on there, all right? No excuses tonight. For me, the uncertainty of following God is threefold, and I just want to give this to you quickly. Number one is the fear of failure. The uncertainty is the fear of failure. I have learned... I guess maybe in my life that that the biggest risk for a Christian is to take no risk. I do not want to get to the end of my life, and I don't want it to be a risk-free life. Now you say, what do you you mean by that? Now, fiscally, fiscally, you might be looking at the most conservative, responsible person walking on the face of the earth. I have to pray for 10 days about spending $1. I don't know how y'all are, you know. You know, some people just spend money all the time. For me, you know, when it comes to that, I, I'm just not a big risk taker. If you saw my portfolio, you would think you were the most unaggressive guy that I have ever met in my life, you know. Uh, I just believe in, in, in uh, spending less than you make and doing it for a long time, you know. That's kind of my philosophy of economics. If I'm making 6%, I'm happy, you know. But when it comes to following God it's different because God is calling us to take a risk which really is no risk at all the only risk really is in our mind because he's saying to you and to me I am the certain God of the uncertain future but here's our problem and listen I, I, this is this may be one of my greatest battles I don't like to fail man I don't I don't and, and, and I, I typically do not involve myself in anything that I think has a chance of failing. And, and, and it's, honestly, it, it's, it's an albatross because it has kept me at times from doing something 
and see. There's nothing greater than trusting God and, and following God and seeing God do it and standing back and saying, I know I couldn't have done that. God had to do it. There's nothing greater in your life other than your salvation. There's nothing greater than God saying, hey, do this. Do this. Nothing greater than God saying, Mark, do this. Steve, do this. Ryan, do this. Tyler, do this. Danny, do this. There's nothing greater than God just bringing something like that into your life. And then you knowing this is risky. And people are, this is crazy. And God said, no, do it. I'll take care of it. And then you do it. And then here's what happens. Henry Blackaby wrote an entire series on this, Experiencing God. He used Moses as, and I hadn't really put it together until just now, but he was using Moses as, as one of his templates. As you follow him and trust him in a risky situation and forget about failure, just follow him and then watch him do it. And then here's what happens. God creates a category of faith that you didn't have before. You didn't have that before. You, you didn't have that category before because you hadn't experienced it before, but now you've experienced it. So now your RAS is allowing that information in so that when you face it, now the fear's gone because he overcame the fear through your experience. He came into your experience, he overcame the obstacles, he proved himself faithful, and now you have a brand new category. Failure is something that I fear. I don't like to get involved in things that, that, that I think might fail. And here's why. It's, it's called pride. I don't want people to think I'm a failure. And what God is saying to me is God is saying to me, John, there's a certain uncertainty about following me, but I'm the one that takes care of this uncertainty because I am certain. I am certain. Number two, how about this? The fear of foolishness. If there's anything I hate as well. I do not, I know, I know y'all love this, but I, I do not like looking like a fool. How many of y'all with me? Thank you. How many of you don't want to look like a fool? I got bad news for you. Very, very bad news. If you follow God, this world is going to say you're a fool. And by the way, There'll be people even in Christian circles that will say, you're a fool. God's chosen the foolish things to confound the wise wisdom of this world. Right now, the agenda in, in your culture is to make people that believe what you believe to look foolish. You believe in a, a creating God? You believe in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth? You believe that? You're a fool, according to this culture. You're foolish. Right now, and this, this doesn't necessarily have anything to do with Christianity, but right now, if you belong to a certain political party, you're a fool. So think about this. If you have a fear of looking foolish, you're going to have a hard time standing for truth and following God. I have a fear of failure. I have a fear of looking foolish. I don't like to. But I have resolved that if I'm going to follow God, I'm going to have to look foolish at some point. And if I can say this, faith is the willingness to look foolish for God. How many of y'all think Noah might have looked foolish? One guy. How many, how many of y'all think Noah might have looked foolish? Anybody with me? Absolutely. Absolutely. How many of y'all think Elijah might have looked foolish on Mount Carmel? David might have looked foolish down in the Valley of Elah. Daniel might have looked foolish in the lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they might have looked foolish. But here's the thing. When all was said and done, they weren't fools. Noah wasn't a fool, and everybody knew it. Daniel wasn't a fool. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they weren't fools. Elijah wasn't a fool. Moses is not a fool. David's not a fool. When all is said and done, everybody knew they were following the true God. And so I just want to reiterate tonight, as God's leaders, there'll be a sense of possible failure. There'll be a risk. There'll be some uncertainty. 
Number two, there'll be a certain stigma of foolishness. Number three, a fear of faith. A fear of faith. I guess if we're all honest, we would have to admit sometimes it's not easy to trust God with your future. Moses fears failure. Lord, I'm going to get in there. I'm going to fall flat on my face. They hate me. They're going to kill me. They're going to prosecute me. Uh, the Israelites, they're not going to give me time of day. I can't even speak. And God says, well, that's, that's understandable, Moses. All that's true except for one thing. I'm going to overcome every bit of it. Moses has a fear of looking like a fool. He says, I'm going to get down there. And who, who am I even going to say that sent me? And God says, i got a real good answer for that. How about I am that I am? And I'll prove I am that I am in ten plagues and at the Red Sea. But I'll look foolish. You won't look foolish when the Red Sea parts. You won't look foolish when you're walking out of Egypt because of the ten plagues. You might look foolish for a while, but you won't look foolish long. And at the very end, Moses is just, he just continues on. And you know the story. He just continues on. And what really is at play here? He has a fear of faith. Lord, I don't know that I can trust you. I don't know that I can trust you. And I just want to tell you tonight, as I've been pastoring for, since I was 29 years old, and before that, working as an associate pastor, he's never ever failed me he's never failed me and I know I know I can trust him with my future whatever's left I can trust him with whatever's left I can trust him with wholeheartedly but I know that right now I'm about to be in for a big fight I'm preparing our church right now. Now, I'm not a doom and gloom preacher, not getting up every week and talking about how bad everything's gotten. You know, I'm not that kind of guy. But I do, in, in small increments, I have been preparing, and I'm actually raising up a team of leaders. I'm raising up a team of elders right now in our church that I deem necessary because I know, as Paul said over in Acts chapter 20, he's talking to the Ephesian elders from the church at Ephesus. Paul is talking to them. He's saying the wolves are coming. And I realized not long ago, I hadn't really prepared a, a lot of our men for what's coming. I've got a group of elders right now that I'm training, and they're going to be hopefully as equipped as I am to be able to lead and to defend and to, you know, go to battle with these wolves that are coming because they are coming. They're already here. The spirit of Antichrist is already here. I don't tell you that. Right now in this church, I don't know that God would call you to that capacity, but God has called every man to stand in the gap because this church is going to come under attack, and it already is. And you combat that with truth. So I have told our church, and I'm telling you, and I'm sure that your pastoral leadership is telling you the same, you can trust God with your future. If you're filling in blanks, let me fill in this quote for you because I know you'll be upset if I dismiss and don't. A.W. Tozer said this. He said, a low view of God is the cause of a hundred lesser evils. A low view of God is the cause of a hundred lesser evils. Some time ago, I was um, reading after Paul Tripp. If you're looking for a good author, read after Paul. You know, I know there's other great authors, but Paul, Paul's a great author. Um, just every, you know, he, just, he just has some great insights. But this is one thing that he said that, that, that has forever, I don't know, talk about a cognitive category. He said this, he said, the reason that many of our men, and even our women, but the reason that many of us are not seeing God's power is because of one central deficiency. He said, we have lost our all of God. We have lost, don't miss this because it is so incredibly significant, we have lost our all of God. 
A couple months ago, I took my family to Jackson Hole. And it's interesting, you know, when you get out there, and I may say more about this tomorrow, but it's interesting when you're, you're in Jackson Hole, you see in Grand Teton. But we're so close to, uh, and I may say more about that tomorrow because it, it, it's fascinating. But, but we did something else. We drove up to Yellowstone because I'd always heard about Old Faithful. And so I wanted to see Old Faithful. I wanted to see this geyser go off. So we get up there, and we get there like an hour early, and we're sitting there on the seats. If you've ever been there, they have seats that are around this geyser. And it's just a big open field, man. It's the biggest nothing you've ever seen. But, man, you can, that thing starts spitting out, and all of a sudden, you know, it shoots up, you know, as high as this ceiling or higher. But I noticed something as I was there. There were people that are working there, and this geyser's about to go off, and many of us are sitting right there, man. We can't wait. We've never seen this thing, and man, it's just an awesome thing, and uh, you know, just the timing of it. And, 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 but I'm looking around, and there's people working there, and this thing's going off. And I see out of the corner of my eye people just walking around. And they're, they're you know, doing something else, working, taking out the trash, and, or, or picking up the trash, and cleaning up, and picking up paper. And it occurred to me something. These people, this thing... It's nothing to them anymore because they've seen it so many times. It's old hat. Now, for a geyser, that's not all that dangerous because I might get tired of seeing a geyser too. I mean, how many times you want to see this thing go off and it be that fascinating? However, it can't happen to a Christian believer with God. We have walked so closely with Him and we have seen Him do so much we get to a point where we lose our all. And I pray that we don't lose our all of God. Lord, thank you for this time we've had together. God, I just pray that you would help us. Lord, as leaders, God, to unlearn the fears in our lives. God, that we would instead, Lord, have a new category of faith. Lord, through you. Lord, I know myself, I know these men, God, I know they want to be strong leaders. God, I know that they want to lead this church and they want to lead this fight. God, they want to stand for truth. But Lord, some of them are fearful. God, I'm, I'm with them. There's certain fears, Lord, that we've learned and we keep learning. God, help us to unlearn the fear of failure, the unlearn the fear of worried about looking foolish. God, help us to unlearn the fear, God, of just faith. Lord, that we would understand that you are capable, you are credible, and you can be trusted with our future. God, I lift up the Abundant Life Baptist Church to you. I lift up the pastoral leadership, the lay leaders. God, the men and women that are here standing for truth. God, would you bless this church? Would you protect this church? And God, would you raise up leaders in this church like Moses? who understand there's a certain uncertainty, but you overcome it all. Lord, we love you. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Brother John, for that. You know, there was a fear I had when I was about 11 years old that caused me to run inside my house on a hot summer day and ask my mom to help me with this fear. I was afraid of dying and going to hell. That's a real fear. And uh, I ran to Jesus that day. Maybe there's some here tonight. Maybe you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Um, the Lord can use fear he did in my life to drive me to the cross. So if you're not saved or you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, I'd love to talk with you tonight and show you how you can know for sure that you're going to heaven. So thank, thank you, Brother John, for coming up. He's uh, here tomorrow as well preaching. So if you want to hear him again, He'll be here tomorrow. Don't forget, downstairs, there's some food waiting for you. Go ahead and enjoy that. And thanks so much for coming. We appreciate it. Have a great night.